Can you hear me now? Is there sound? All right, well, it's probably good that you couldn't hear me because I was frantically talking about technology issues. So why not add no sound on top of that? <laughs> I apologize, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, it's really great to be here. I've been looking forward to doing this all day, um, all morning here. It's noon for me on the West Coast. So thank you so much for joining with joining me. And thank you for being patient as I work out the technology aspect. I had started the entire live stream right at 12 o'clock and um, for some reason, something didn't connect. So I was here in the Zoom room talking and realizing that I don't think anybody can hear me and nobody's watching. <laughs> so here we are. I think everything is working now. Yes, we have some uh, positive feedback in the chat. Thank you so much to those of you in the chat that are letting me know when there are issues. I really appreciate that. Um, and go ahead and say hello if you haven't already said so in the chat. I'm so happy to have you all here. Let me know where you're joining from. I really look forward to these live streams and I look forward to hearing from all of you and getting to know you a little bit. So it's just wonderful to have you all here. I'm grateful for you. Um, thank you so much, Bonnie Lee and Talis and Lulu Keys and Thomas for letting me know about the sound and Sue, thank you for letting me know you can hear me now. Um, and Bonnie, that's, that's really great. Okay, so we're gonna dive in. Today, we're gonna be talking about musicality. And musicality is something that I love to talk about because that's why we all play music, right? We have something to say. We want to express ourselves at the piano or at our instrument. But when we go to do it, it can be really challenging because the concepts around musicality can feel a little bit ambiguous and can it can be hard to distill those concepts into actual techniques to practice and actual things to do to get the result that we want. So we're gonna spend some time talking about that today. Uh, I'm gonna give you tons of ideas and tons of techniques that you can implement into your practice so that you can sound better. So those of you that know me know that it's my goal to help you uh, improve at piano and to be effective and efficient and simple. So we're gonna simplify these things for you today. We're gonna have a jam-packed hour, so be sure to ask questions along the way. That's always my style. Um, I know you can't actually like unmute and interrupt me, but if you could, I would tell you to do that, but go ahead and type in the chat and I will try to keep an eye on it and answer questions as they come up. And then I also have a time specifically at the end of the live stream where we can, where I can answer questions. Um, so you can, you can wait till then as well. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. Oh, cool, we have someone from the UK, Sue, it's great to have you, and Nick in the UK, that's awesome. Welcome in. Okay, here we go. So, how to play musically. Now, we're gonna start by reading some of, some of these common things that I hear um, from adults before they start working with me. Things like, I know the sound that I want, but I'm not quite sure how to actually make that sound. And I'm sure you can all relate to this. Like we've heard recordings, we've heard people play music in a way that we want to play, but it can be much more challenging to bridge the gap between what we're hearing and what we're producing at the piano. Um, dynamics as a concept seem easy, right? If you have seen, you know, piano and forte and you know the definitions of those words, they're not necessarily difficult to understand. But when I'm playing, they're just one more thing to think about because there's already so many things to think about when you're playing the piano. We are holding so many things in our awareness when we're practicing and when we're playing that dynamics sometimes can feel like just an additional thing. Um, how do I make my playing sound more musical? Or everything else gets in the way of musicality. There are too many things to think about. So we've all said these things or had these thoughts or thoughts that are similar to these. And I'm curious, if any of these sound familiar to you. So go ahead and let me know in the chat if, if you've said things or thought things like this in your practice about just, you know, like dynamics can be this odd sticking point um, for some of us or for most of us really in this process. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. We can, we can learn some strategies. So if the ultimate goal is to make music, right? We want our playing to be music we want it to be musical, then let's be musical from the very beginning. And it's something that is easier said than done, but we're gonna talk a lot about how to do it. So we're gonna focus today talking about dynamics, voicing, articulation, tempo, and this idea of music as a tool for connection. And I'm gonna give you strategies for each of these things 
you know, concrete things that you can actually put on a checklist or put in your practice journal and work into your practice routine to improve your ability to be musical with all of these different tools at your disposal. Now, musicality is also supported by all of these things. So confidence at the piano, accuracy in our notes and our rhythm and all of those other symbols that we see in the score. It's really difficult to be musical if we aren't confident in what we're doing or if we're not able to play accurately because then we're, we're getting distracted by all the interruptions of the music. And so we of course want to support our musicality with practicing and with becoming confident and becoming accurate with what we're doing in our playing. We want to make sure that we're using proper practice techniques and that we're sitting in proper alignment and flexibility. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. We also want to try to have an understanding of some, you know, music theory concepts that will support our musicality. Things like the harmonic structure of the piece or the musical form of the piece. And we're not going to dive as much into these concepts today because these are concepts that I talk a lot about in my YouTube videos. And this is what the whole entire focus of the last boot camp was, was different practice techniques and ways to organize your practice time so that you could attain all of the things on this slide. So if you need help in these areas, make sure to check out that last boot camp if you haven't already, or go ahead. I linked some videos in, in the description of this video um, that can be really supportive with some of these skills that you'll need to support your musicality. But we're going to dive in and we're going to focus more on these things today, like dynamics, voicing, articulation, tempo, and connection. So to get us started, there is no such thing as too much drama. We're going to talk about this a lot. Um, I have yet to go to a musical performance or to hear someone play and think, mm, you know, that was just like a little too dramatic for my taste. That's not a thing that happens. When we are listening to music and when we're experiencing music, we want that drama. We need that drama. Um, my One of my teachers from college used to say that most people will forget, will forgive and forget probably, forgive and forget most of the errors that you make. So you can play wrong notes, you can play wrong rhythms, you can make mistakes in your performance. If you make them feel something because you are expressing and sharing and connecting through your music, everything else will be forgiven. And I think that there's so much truth to that because that's the ultimate goal with music, right? Is we're trying to communicate something. We want to connect with people. We want to connect with the music. And so we can't be too dramatic. And we'll talk about that a lot today. It's going to come up a lot. Um, I have a question in the chat. How much musicality is learned versus from talent from Lulu Keys? That's a great question. And I think it's a little bit of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg or, you know, the, um, the debate about like nature versus nurture. I don't think there's a super clear answer. I think that there are some people and I have encountered some students that I don't have to teach them how to be musical. It kind of oozes out of them. And also I would say that that's not most people and that musicality 100% can be learned. That's why composers have tempo markings in their scores and dynamics in their scores and articulation marks because those are like little morsels or little clues as like a roadmap of how to make the piece more musical and of how to be musical when we're playing music. So a little bit of both probably, but I would say more often than not, I teach it and people can do it if they want to do it and if they understand how to do it. So let's start by talking about voicing. So voicing, first of all, is the idea of bringing out something, bringing out something to make it really obvious to the listener and to yourself what we are supposed to be listening to. And so I like to start with the question of what needs to be voiced. And oftentimes it's the melody, right? We want to hear the melody. Not every piece of music that we play on the piano, but 97% of the pieces that we play on the piano, if we're playing solo piano, have a melody. And I'm not going to make any claims about what that melody will be or which hand it's going to be in or in what voice it will be in, but there is a melody. And one of my old teachers used to say the difference between a good pianist and a spectacular pianist is the ability to find that melody and bring it out. And when we think about musicality, we, the, the term exaggeration comes to mind a lot. So when we know where our melody is, 
we need to exaggerate that voicing. We need to make sure that not only do we know where that melody is, and we are 100% sure of where that melody is, but also that anyone else who happens to be overhearing our playing knows where that melody is because we're doing such a fantastic job of bringing out the melody. So I put an example up here on the screen. This is um, one of the Chopin preludes, opus, opus 28, number seven. And in this piece, we can see that the melody is in the right hand. And you'll, if you don't recognize it by the music, you'll probably recognize it when I, when I play a little example for you. But the melody is in the right hand, and I'm gonna go ahead and highlight it. We have chords in the right hand too. And in this case, the melody is the top note of the chords or of those harmonic intervals. And so we always wanna be bringing out that top voice. And often, I can't say all the time, but often in piano music, our melody will be at the top of a chord if you're playing a chord, or at the top of a series of notes that are played at the same time. That's often the case, not always, but often. So I'm gonna play just the melody for you so that you can hear this piece. That's the very first line of the melody. So it's that top note of everything that's happening. So when I want to practice voicing, I'm going to exaggerate it, there's our word again, and I'm not gonna worry about dynamics or making it sound beautiful at this stage in my practicing because I've just identified where the melody is and now I'm going to practice voicing it. So I'm gonna allow myself the permission that it's gonna sound maybe a little bit ugly or maybe a little bit clunky and that's okay. My goal right now is to play all the notes in the right hand, but to throw the weight into the top note. So specifically when I get to this chord on beat two of measure one and this chord on beat three of measure one and any other chord, I want to hear that melody note on the top of the chord sounding out more than the other notes of the chord. And it's complex, it's a hard thing to do because we're essentially trying to make part of our hand play with more weight or with more sound than the other part of our hand. So this is what it would sound like if I were to practice that. And I'm gonna warn you, it's not gonna be the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. It's gonna sound a little bit clunky. And I'm gonna take this chord on beat two. And this is a note I wanna bring out. So I'm gonna really throw the weight in there. There we go. Now I'm able to play all three notes at the same time with more weight into that third finger. Now, thankfully I do that chord three times, in, three times in a row. So now I'm gonna go on. Now here, it's my top note, this F sharp that is the melody, and I'm playing a D on the bottom. So again, I'm throwing the weight into the top part of the hand. And you can hear after a few times of doing it, I start to get this note ringing out above this note, and that's exactly what I want. So when we're practicing voicing, we can do this in one hand, like in this exercise, where I really need to voice the melody on top of all of the other notes in the same hand. I can also do this with the left hand. So when I go to put everything back together, which in this demonstration I'm doing very quickly, in your piano practice it would take a much longer time for you to go through the entire top line and for you to really feel comfortable with that. When I go to put everything together, I then continue to make sure that even once I add the left hand, that top line or that melody is being voiced out above everything else. Something that can be really helpful with this when we go to add it back together is to imagine that whichever part of, or whichever finger or whichever part of your hand has the melody, has bricks tied to your wrist, whereas the other part, the accompaniment, which in this case is the left hand and the bottom part of the right hand, has some balloons tied to it and we're kind of floating off the keys. So once I've worked on that and I've been able to throw the weight into the melody over and over and over again, I start to put it back together and I get this. And it's this great sound of a melody that's singing out with other voices below it.
And this is one of my favorite things about the piano. We really have such a versatile instrument that can produce so many different sounds. And I like to imagine that whatever my melody is, it's a singer or a certain instrument. And then I like to imagine that the other voices, the accompaniment voices, are a different instrument to get that contrast between the two. And this is a great thing if you're a teacher and you're watching, it's a great thing to do with younger students. Um, and you can even look up the sounds of different instruments. And if you're an adult that's just watching this to get better on your own, actually assign different instruments. In this case, I would say that my melody is a singer, maybe a soprano singing up really high. And maybe the soprano is being accompanied by a cello down here in the left hand or some string basses and then in the other part of the right hand those other notes of the chord maybe that's um maybe that's some violins or maybe even like an oboe or something like that but it can really create a lot of different it can spark a lot of different creative ideas when you imagine other instruments and when you imagine other voices singing that melody or playing that melody now we can also use different touches to create different sounds with the voicing. So there's a couple of different kinds that I use the most. Um, we'll talk more about this when we're talking about dynamics, but when we're thinking about voicing, my melody note, I was playing with a really rounded finger because I wanted, I wanted to be able to land on it and put the weight of my arm behind that melody note. Whereas in the left hand, I was pulling the sound out of the keys with this motion, almost like I was like petting a little soft kitten. And I was playing a little bit more on the pads of my fingers, which isn't something that we want to make a habit of when we're thinking of piano technique. But when we're going for a very specific sound, especially when that sound is quiet, we can utilize the pads of the fingers to help us pull the sound out of the keys. And that can create a really gentle sound. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I play this left hand regularly and I'm just dropping into the keys, I get one sound and I'm going to do the next measure too. But if I adjust just a little bit to be on the pads of my fingers, I can do that pulling out motion. And I hope you can hear a difference. Um, with the sound quality. I hope you can hear a difference in how gentle it sounds and how it actually completely changes the tone produced when we just make that slight alteration to how we're, how we're approaching the key and how we're, how we're playing those keys. So let me know in the comments if you've if you've ever experimented with different touches like that. There are I mean, there are a lot of them. That's like a, a whole nother hour class just about the different touches that we can utilize. But I'll give you some ideas today and I'll give you a few more when we talk about dynamics as well. Um, the other things to keep in mind about voicing, you can do it even though it's hard. Okay. That's the number one thing that I hear when discussing musicality with students is that it's hard and that is accurate. It is very hard. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing to do, but it's a really worthwhile endeavor because if we go back to that quote that I was talking about at the beginning of, you know, the difference between a good pianist and a great pianist is often voicing bringing out the melody um, and well, knowing where that melody is and being able to bring it out. So don't give up. Make sure that you find the melody. Make sure that you practice bringing it out. And a great way to check that you know where your melody is, is if you can sing along with it. And that's something that I have students do from the very beginning is, you know, if you were to pull out a piece and you're learning it from the very beginning, find the melody, sing the melody, memorize what the melody sounds like to the point that away from the piano, you can sing along and you can, you can sing that melody. And ultimately, when we get to the point that we are playing a piece all the way through and we have practiced all of the technical elements, we've practiced all the notes, we're playing it pretty accurately. When we really want to go for that musicality, we sing with the melody. If you're listening to the melody and you're singing along with the melody, that is what everyone else will hear when they are listening. If you're listening to the left hand because you are unsure of the left hand or because there's a lot of notes in the left hand, um, that is what everyone else will hear. Okay, so just keep that in mind that whatever you're listening to when you're playing is what will come out in your playing. All right, we have talked 
some good talk about voicing. So let me know in the chat if there are questions about voicing. I am gonna go on and we'll talk a little bit about dynamics now, but like I said, we'll have time for questions and we can always come back and I can answer, um, answer any questions about voicing. So dynamics are really fun. Dynamics are something that we often learn early in our piano studies, especially if you're studying with a teacher or a book. Um, dynamics are like, you know, piano, forte, crescendo, decrescendo, all of those symbols in our music that tell us how loud or how quiet to play. Now, when we talk about dynamics, we have to talk a little bit about the mechanics of playing and how we actually produce dynamics at the piano. Um, and I'll talk about an acoustic piano. And obviously it's a little bit different on a keyboard, but it's still helpful to know how dynamics are actually produced. So when we strike a string or when we strike a key on the piano, a hammer strikes a string inside the piano. And in order to make different dynamics or different volumes on the piano, we have to strike that string with a different amount of pressure or force. And the number one thing that I see that holds people back in dynamics is that they are trying to produce sound with their fingers like this. So we're using our fingers or maybe we're using our hand to produce the dynamics, but we're not utilizing the full weight of our arm and proper alignment in playing dynamics. It's really important to think about dynamics as a distribution of weight in our arms. That is what dynamics are. It doesn't matter if we're trying to play forte or piano or anything in between or anything more extreme. It's all about how much weight you have in your arm and the velocity or the speed with which you're gonna play the note. So when thinking about dynamics, something that I've talked a lot about in my videos, so if you are a long time uh, visitor of the channel, you might have heard this before, is I like to assign dynamic numbers to, or not, sorry, I like to assign dynamics, my goodness, I like to assign numbers to dynamics. There we go. I like to assign numbers to dynamics. And we can practice this. And the great thing about this technique is it gives us a really concrete way to evaluate if we're doing the dynamics as we intend to do them. So if I'm going to say that piano or pianissimo is one and forte is 10, a great exercise is to pick one note on the piano and to practice starting at one and then gradually increasing the amount of weight that I'm letting fall from my arm until I get to 10. And so it looks like this, and I want you all to listen really carefully and tell me if I make an even crescendo from one to 10, or if I have notes that poke out or notes that drop out. So I'm gonna start here. Actually, I'll go here. And this is gonna be my number one. And then as I get louder to number 10, you'll hear this crescendo. So one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So let me know in the chat if that was even or not. I have some thoughts. It, it was generally even, but I think between four and five, there was a little bit of like a jump in volume. And then again, between like six and seven, there was a little bit of a jump in volume. But you can do this exercise several times with one finger in the right hand. You can do it with your left hand. You can do it with different fingers. You can do it with different combinations of notes as well, because obviously we want to start with one note and we want to just really tune into that one note. But then ultimately, when we're when we're working on dynamics, it's not going to be one note usually. So we can do it with a chord. We could do it with chords in the in both hands, um, and we can elaborate on that exercise to tune into what things sound like. I think that's the number one thing that this exercise helps with. Is it actually helps you evaluate where is your piano, where is your forte. Do you tend to do crescendos pretty evenly, but struggle with decrescendos? Do you tend to do decrescendos pretty evenly, but struggle with crescendos? It really helps you tune in and evaluate your own playing and your own sense of dynamics. And then the other thing that it obviously does is it helps you produce those dynamics because you're, you're really listening and you're really focusing just on getting louder. Then you can reverse the exercise as well and go from 10 to one and getting quieter as well. Dynamics are completely relative and subjective to you and to your instrument and to the situation and to the space that you're playing in. So if I'm playing for you, you know, in a tiny studio 
and I'm playing on a baby grand piano, that's going to be a completely different experience of dynamics than if I'm playing on a nine foot Steinway in a concert hall that seats 2000 people right? Very, very, very different experiences. And I will most likely change how I'm approaching the dynamics based on those two different situations. So that's the other thing to keep in mind with dynamics is that it's important that you get in touch with your arm weight and with your proper alignment and with your ability to produce these dynamics so that you can make adjustments based on you. Um, oftentimes I have students asking me like, was that quiet enough? Was that loud enough? And there are answers to those questions, but also ask yourself those questions because if you tell me that this is piano and you're, that's your level one and you in fact can get louder all the way to a level 10 off of that, it works, right? It works because you're setting the tone for what that piano dynamic is or for what that level one dynamic is. Um, I would say piano is more like this. Um, but it's really dependent on the situation and, and the piece that you're playing. So Bonnie Lee's asking, will a digital piano work as well as an acoustic for the dynamic exercise? You can absolutely do the exercise on the digital piano. My, in my experience, what I found is that with digital pianos, you don't get the exact same feedback. So the feedback might not be as, um, as specific, which can actually be a pro sometimes and a con sometimes because digital pianos will tend to be pretty consistent to your own, like to your instrument. So your digital piano will be consistent to your digital piano, regardless, it's not gonna go out of tune. You're not gonna need to get, you know, the mechanisms adjusted, adjusted or anything like that. You, so that's a pro is that it's gonna be very consistent for you. The con is that um, you won't get quite the same like reverberation and feeling and feedback just because the sound is a little bit different. So I always encourage everybody regardless of what you're practicing on, to practice on as many different instruments if you can. You know, if you go to church or you have a friend that has a different piano, go ahead and tinker around a little bit and practice adjusting to those different kinds of instruments and those different pianos and the different keyboards because that's a really great thing to be able to do. But yeah, you can still do this exercise on a digital piano, absolutely. Um, it's just gonna be slightly different and, and you can adjust based on your piano. Now, um, before we go on to the next things, one, one thing I do wanna mention, I've hinted at it a little bit, is proper alignment when you're doing dynamics. Because dynamics are so fully based on the amount of weight that you're putting into, um, and the amount of weight that you let drop from your arm, you need to be sitting at the proper height and the proper distance from your piano. And I talk a ton about this in a lot of videos because alignment and posture really can make or break so many things that you're trying to do at the piano. So just to review really quickly, you wanna make sure that you're sitting at the proper height. And the proper height, I have an adjustable bench here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that. The proper height is when my arm can be making a 90 degree angle or this uppercase L. Um, the proper distance is that my arms are about parallel with my torso. I'm sitting back a little further and I'm leaning in because that helps me feel like ready and prepared. We don't wanna be leaning out like this and we don't wanna be so close like this. We want to have our arms parallel with our torso so we really have the range to move around the piano as flexibly as possible. Um, the number one error I will, see, say, I will say that I see with dynamics specifically is sitting at the wrong height. If I'm sitting too high, I'm going to have a big like crick in my, ret, in my wrist that's going to make it really difficult to utilize my arm weight. And if I'm sitting too low, I'm going to have a V at my elbow that's also going to make it really difficult to utilize my arm weight. I need that 90 degree angle. So if you don't have an adjustable bench or if your keyboard stand isn't adjustable, there are lots of different things. I used to, um, when I would travel around and compete a lot, I actually like took with me this like, it, it was one of my teachers, it was like a, an old pack of newspapers that someone had sewn into like a black box. And I would take that with me because I found that oftentimes benches were not high enough for me. I like to, I have to sit kind of high. Um, you can sit on books, you can try to find a different chair, try to find a different um, stand for your keyboard. You can also, adjustable benches, I, I have one linked in the description below to one of my favorite ones that a bunch of my students have purchased. It's, I think it's around $100, um, but it's a great, great investment because it's gonna, like I said, make or break a lot of the things you're trying to do. So, proper posture, and then let's see. Start with what's in the score. 
So with your dynamics, there are generally some suggestions in the score, depending on what music you're reading from. We can see in this prelude that they said piano at the beginning and dolce, which means sweet. Um, and then they didn't write a ton. There's one crescendo right here. But if I were to play this piece, I would start with that as a guide and then I would add my own. And with dynamics in general, I like to use the rule three experiments. So I would take this first phrase and I would come up with three different options for dynamics. So maybe I keep the whole thing piano like they suggest. I would never do that, that would be boring. But let's say I'm gonna start piano and I'm gonna crescendo through the entire thing. So let's hear that. If I just start piano and crescendo through that entire top line and you can type in the chat if you like this dynamic expression or not. one option. I liked it. Okay. Let me know in the chat if you liked it. I'm going to try another option where I'm going to crescendo. I'm going to start piano. I'm going to crescendo to here to this third chord in measure two. And then I'm going to start loud on the second half of the phrase and I'm going to make a decrescendo. So kind of like hairpins like that. that a little bit better. That one was good. And now I'm going to try a third one just for the sake of trying it where I'm going to start piano and crescendo to the third chord. And then I'm going to start over. I'm going to start piano again and crescendo to the end of the phrase. So let's hear that one. So I didn't like that one as much. Um, I'd be curious to know your thoughts, which one you liked. I think my favorite was number two, where I did the hairpin, the, the crescendo to the middle of the phrase, and then the decrescendo to the end of the phrase. But you can see there's a lot of different options. And when it comes to dynamics, there are common practices. Like if you're playing a piece that's really well known, yes, there might be parts of that piece that everybody does the same or that everybody does similarly with dynamics, but there's not really wrong dynamics like there's not really a wrong way to play dynamics as long as you decide on dynamics you're expressive you're dramatic and i would say um you know never play more than a couple of measures at the same dynamic volume because then it gets boring and it gets monotonous but as long as you're doing something and you're committed to that something that you're doing and you're convicted about it and it and you're convinced that it sounds good you will absolutely convince other people that it sounds good with the way that you play it um, Chalice said I like option two, but crescendo a little bit less. Bonnie also liked number two. Yeah, yeah. And when you're doing that experimenting where you're testing out different dynamics, you might not get the exact version of what you want on the first time. Like you might take that first idea and do it several times until you do it how you would like it if you were to choose that option. And so keep that in mind. But this is something I love to do. And I do this with all my pieces and I do it with all of my students. We go through every single phrase and we come up with an exact plan of dynamics. Because once we have that plan, then we can practice the dynamics and get them into our memory. And I would say that that is one of the more common errors that I see people make is just thinking that dynamics are something that you can just add on a whim when you're playing. But that's not the case. Dynamics are something that need to be practiced into your memory, just like anything else, just like the proper notes, just like the proper rhythm, just like any other symbol in your music. So make your choice about dynamics, allow yourself the space to experiment, make a choice, write that choice down. And then from that point on, you always play the section with those dynamics. And you can even have practice sessions that are completely devoted to memorizing those dynamics and to making sure that you are consistently playing with the dynamics to the point that you don't have to think about them anymore. Because even if you forget to think about dynamics, your hands will remember, your ear will remember because it's a part of your memory now in that piece. Now, you can always change your dynamics later as well. Sometimes it's hard to make a choice that lasts forever when we're first starting a piece, but I, I think it's much more important to make a choice because making a choice gets you thinking about dynamics and gets you in the habit of keeping them in the forefront of your mind. And then later on, if you realize, oh, the piece goes a lot faster than I thought it did, or 
this part really sounds a lot different at this new tempo or whatever the case is, you can always adjust those dyna dynamics and make changes. The nice thing about dynamics is that once you get comfortable thinking about them and playing with dynamics, they're, I'm not going to say they're easy to change, but they're a little easier to change later in the process than like fingering or incorrect rhythm or incorrect notes. So make a choice, experiment with the different choices, write it in your music, and practice it. All right, any questions on dynamics? I know we just covered a lot on that slide and there's a lot more we could cover, but we're gonna go on and talk a little bit about, a little bit about some other things. So let me know if there are any questions. So articulation and tempo. Articulation is how we articulate the notes, meaning staccatos, legatos, two note slurs, accents, all of those um, symbols that tell us how to play the notes. So with articulation, of course, we need to know what those symbols are. So if you're seeing articulation symbols in your score and you're not sure what they are, look them up, make sure that you know what they mean, listen to a few examples um, so you really get a sense of what those articulation markings are. With articulations, they play into musicality for sure, because if I, you know, just for example, in this prelude, it's all legato, so it's nice and smooth and connected, and we hear that. If I were to play it staccato, it would be a completely different piece. Right, it's completely different. So articulations for sure contribute to the entire feel and um, experience of, um, of a piece. So we need to know what they are. And then with articulations, we need to practice them similar to dynamics. So we can actually take small sections, measures or a few measures at a time and practice working those dynamics into our muscle memory and into the other kinds of memories. And we wanna make sure that we stay loose. We don't want tension to creep in, especially with, um, well, with any of them really, we don't want tension to creep in. But one of the things that I see often is with staccatos, people think staccatos, you know, the meaning is short and detached. So we, we see the staccato symbol and we know we have to play it short. And so all of a sudden people start like poking the note, like boop, to make it short. And really, if we can remain loose and we can play the note as it's meant to be played and release it with a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of looseness in our wrist, we get a much more graceful sound. Because if I poke the staccato out like this, I'm getting that sound. Whereas if I play like this, I play the note the same, I remain, remain loose and flexible. It's a lot more graceful sound. And depending on the piece and the context, of course, there's a time and a place for both. But we want to stay loose and we don't want any of our articulations to sound forced, unless that's the purpose of the articulation and, and you want that like forceful sound. Um, someone said, why can't you play dynamics on a whim? Um, you can. I mean, you can play dynamics on a whim for sure, especially if you are at the level of playing that you've done enough experimenting with dynamics that you have all of the ability to come up with an idea on the spot and execute it on the spot and do it well. Absolutely. Um, you can play dynamics on a whim. But when we are trying to learn how to improve dynamics or improve our musicality, mapping it out, writing it in the score, practicing it, that is the way that we eventually get to the point that we have those tools in our skill set to be able to play them on a whim or to be able to play them a little bit more improvisatory or in that moment. Um, to some degree, do you think dynamics should be subjective? I've never kind of... Oh yeah, definitely. Lulu Keys is asking, to some degree, do you think dynamics should be subjective? I've never quite understood why we must play the dynamics the way it is written. What if the pianist interpretation is different? 100%, I fully agree with you. <laughs> um, and I was saying that a little bit earlier. I think dynamics are totally subjective. I t change dynamics all the time, especially if you're playing Western classical music that was written over 100 years ago. Most of the dynamics that you're seeing in the score are not the composer's dynamics. It's someone that has edited the score and written in those dynamics after the fact. So dynamics are very, very, very subjective. Um, and I would say change them as much as you want. Um, that might be a polarizing opinion, but especially if you, you know, if you're unsure of how to change them, you can always run it by someone who has a little bit more knowledge. But yes, dynamics are completely subjective, can be changed. They are based on your interpretation. Okay. Um, 
with articulations, we want to make sure that we imagine the purpose of the articulation and use that as a guide for how to play it. And what I mean by this is to take into context like where the articulation is and what it means. Legato is the easy one, right? Legato is smooth and connected and a lot of music that we play is legato. But if I'm playing a piece and the dynamic marking is forte and there are accents and staccatos, I'm going to interpret that as those particular notes should be like kind of percussive and maybe even a little bit rough or violent sounding because there's accents, which means strong and there's staccatos, which mean kind of short and there's a forte. So I'm going to play those. I'm going to interpret that to mean, you know, quite forced and loud and, and maybe even like bordering on a little bit violent. Whereas if I'm playing a Mozart piano sonata and there's staccato markings and it's piano and it says dolce, which means sweetly, I'm going to approach those staccatos quite different. So with articulations, we want to take the context of the articulation. We want to look at the articulation in combination with the dynamics, with the tempo marking, with the title of the piece. Is it the melody? Is it the accompaniment? And we want to use all of that information to help us make choices about how we're going to play the articulations. Um, sometimes our articulations are very specific. Like for example, there's a piece called The Wild Rider by Schumann that has little sforzandos or accents on some of the notes. And um, the piece is called The Wild Rider. And the imagery that a lot of people use to describe the piece is like a, a small child riding around on a wooden horse, bumping into things when you see those little accents and those sforzandos. Knowing that is very helpful when you go to play those accents and those sforzandos because there's a context for them and a meaning behind them. And so if you can't find that information, you can always come up with some, you know, imagine imaginary things that you think the composer might have been trying to convey with those articulations and you can play them accordingly. And that can be a very helpful way to approach articulations. Now with tempo, we never want to play faster than we can play musically. I see a lot of people getting hung up on the tempo marking. So if your tempo marking says allegro, people think, oh my gosh, I have to play fast. It has to be fast and they sacrifice accuracy and dynamics and other elements of musicality just to get that fast tempo. And that is never the way we want to go. Tempos, just like dynamics, are subjective. And that's partially what makes them a little bit challenging, but also the wonderful thing about music because we can interpret it in a way that works for us. So with tempo, we want to start slow always and we can work towards the tempo marking. But if, if a piece says allegro, if I look at my metronome or if you Google it, allegro is anywhere on my metronome from like 132 to 168. That's a pretty big range. And if I'm playing a piece by Haydn, that's allegro, Haydn didn't live in a time where there was a metronome that existed. So I guarantee you when Haydn wrote allegro on his piano sonata, he was not thinking 200 years from now, someone needs to play this from 132 to 168. That's not how tempo works. It's a suggestion to be taken into context with everything else. So you never want to sacrifice the musicality. If I can play my piece, if it's marked Allegro and I can play it at 120, which might technically be a little slower than Allegro, but I can play it at 120 and it sounds amazing. I'm able to express myself. I can play accurately. I can play musically. That's a winning tempo. And maybe that changes and evolves over time as I get more comfortable with that tempo. But those are the things we need to take into consideration. We don't ever sacrifice those things to play fast. Um, and then I, I talk about this a lot, but if we focus on playing accurately and with musicality, a faster tempo is the byproduct of that. Oftentimes when we're focusing specifically on trying to play fast, we're making so many mistakes and there's so many things going wrong that we won't I'm not going to say we won't ever get to that tempo, but it's going to be a much longer and more challenging journey to get to that tempo and to be able to do things accurately than if we just focus on accuracy and musicality. Tempo is also something that changes over time, kind of like what I said about dynamics. You might be able to play at a certain tempo now and everything sounds amazing. And in three months, if you're still working on the piece, that tempo might change and you might be able to go a lot faster and still maintain that musicality. And that's a little bit the nature of tempo and the way that the learning process works as well. Okay, type your questions in the chat if you have them. 
we're going to go on and talk about connection. So connection, in my opinion, this is my philosophy, is, is the foundation of music. Music is about connecting with ourselves, the music, other people, the past, the future, the present. It's about connection. And I think that's why music has existed since humans have existed and why it persists as an art form, regardless of like what kind of funding it receives or the popularity or the genre or the time period. Music is always present where humans are present. And so when we think about connecting, there are some things that we can do that can help strengthen and deepen our connection with music um, and with our ability to express ourselves through music. So here are a few of my favorite things to do to help connect with the pieces that I'm working on and to help my students connect with their pieces. So one of the things that I love to do is to listen to recordings and to take note of what I like and what I didn't like and then copy what I like. Um, all artists copy, right? Like there's very few things that are 100% unique when they are created. We are all made up of all of our experiences to this point and we draw on those experiences constantly um, to you know, kind of spit back out as, as our art form. So when you are learning a piece, I like to actually take a piece of paper and write down who I'm listening to and then take notes the whole time I'm listening. I'll follow along with a score, with a musical score, and I'll say, okay, in this section they played piano, in this section they did a huge crescendo, in this section they did this. Here's what I liked, here's what I didn't like, here's what I'm gonna maybe steal and try in my music, in my interpretation of this piece. And it can be a really great way, especially if you're feeling lost, or you're feeling like you're getting stuck in that stage with dynamics where you don't even have, like you can't think of ideas to test out, this is a great thing to do before that because it'll help you brainstorm some ideas and some things to do. Um, another question that I really like to ask my students is if your piece was a soundtrack to a movie or a TV show, what would be happening? If you were listening to it and you're actually like watching a story play out on the screen. And that's a question that can lead to there's no right answers. I mean, any answer is the right answer because it helps you get in touch with what you're feeling in a, in a storytelling way. As humans, we're storytellers, right? We're always telling stories, we're always listening to stories, we're always connecting through stories. So making up stories about your pieces can be a really great way to help you connect to that musical and dramatic element of them. Um, something that I love to do is to research the composer and the history, maybe the time period, um, the background of the piece, if you can find any information. And you can do this with anything. I mean, you know, bands that are alive today, you can look up what their songs are about, or you can look up different performances and different times that they've done those songs live. This Chopin piece, um, the, the prelude, number seven from Opus 28, comes from Opus 28, which is Chopin's cycle of 24 preludes. He wrote these preludes and they cover all of the major and minor keys. And he copied Bach a little bit in that sense. Um, Bach did the same thing with his preludes and fugues in the well-tempered clavier. Um, he wrote the preludes when he was traveling with George Sand, who was, who is the pen name of the woman who he was in love with for most of his life. He was traveling with her and her children and they were, I think like escaping the, um, like just escaping the cold weather in France. And so that's when he wrote them. Um, a prelude, which is the title of the piece is usually throughout history has meant that it's like a precursor to something, like in the Bach Prelude and Fugues, the prelude comes first and it's like a precursor to the fugue. But Chopin kind of took that title and that form and made pieces that stand alone, um, that don't come before anything. They're just, you know, works that stand all alone. Um, another tidbit that I think is interesting that I think about whenever I play music from Chopin is that he didn't think of himself as a great pianist. Uh, which I find to be really fascinating because obviously we consider Chopin to be like one of the greatest composers of all time. But when it came to playing his own music, he didn't love to play his own music. He didn't concertize as much. He wasn't like Liszt. He didn't travel around and perform concerts all over the world because he wasn't as confident in his pianistic abilities to play, um, even though he wrote all of this spectacular deep music. Um, he suffered from a lot of physical ailments throughout his life and he eventually died of tuberculosis. And so knowing things like this about composers or about the pieces really helps me connect to like their humanness and to the human elements in their music. Because once we start to get to know why 
someone wrote something or even just who someone was beyond a name on the paper, we can start to, um, you know, see similarities and see differences and connect with them in a different way. And so it can really help us with the musicality aspect. Um, we can experiment. We talked about this with dynamics. So we always want to try different things. Try, try at least three things before you make a choice on what you're going to do. That's a good rule of thumb. Um, singing along with the melody, which we talked about as well, especially for voicing, but singing along can help you connect like inside yourself with the musicality. Moving with music is great. And you can do that in a bunch of different ways. If you're, you can dance, of course, if you're not into dancing, you can also just, you know, put on your headphones or turn on the piece that you're working on and let yourself move in whatever way feels natural to you. That could be swaying. It could be clapping. It could be little tiny movements, but just letting yourself like experience that experience that music in your body that can be very helpful as well and then lastly listening to your piece away from the piano so find your favorite recordings and listen when you're you know on your way to work or when you are um cleaning the house or whatever it is that you're doing you can listen to your piece away from the piano and let it wash over you and have it be in the background or actively listen it's going to help you get to know that piece on different levels regardless of how you listen to it so those are some of my ideas for connection. I'm curious if any of you have done any of this stuff before or if you've explored this concept of connecting to your music and to yourself through your music. Um, I'd love to hear if so, if you want to type it in the chat. And then I'd also love to take any questions if anybody has any. Um, we have a few minutes, so I'll wait a second and kind of check the chat, but let me know if you have any questions about any of this. Um, yeah, like I said at the beginning, it, they, they're ambiguous concepts, and so it can be difficult to figure out concrete ways to actually practice them. But I know we've gone over lots, um, lots today, and I have a lot more in, in other videos as well. But if you have questions, go ahead. And while I'm waiting in the questions, um, I wanted to extend to all of you here today, thank you so much for coming, and I wanted to extend um, a special invite to you. I recently launched, uh, or relaunched, I should say, my Casual to Confident Piano Player membership. Um, that's a really cool m way to get like kind of the best of private instruction, but in a group format. Um, there's classes scheduled throughout the month, and you get to join as many of those classes as you'd like. And if you feel like you have some holes in your learning, like maybe you're on and you're, you've been doing this for a while, and you've got a good process, you know what you want to learn, you know what kind of music you want to play, but you're having a little bit trouble getting there, then this might be a really good fit for you. Um, so I'm offering just today, and I'll leave it up for a couple of days, um, some free 15 minute phone consultations um, or Zoom consultations, I should say, where I can meet with you and hear a little bit about your struggles and, you know, just get to know how I can help you, whether that's advice during that phone call or directing you to outside resources like videos um, or telling you a little bit about the, the program. I just want to make sure that you are all getting the most out of your piano studies. I know I know that you are investing time and energy and I'm so proud of you for that because you've showed up here, you know, on a Tuesday afternoon to try to further your education and further your skills as a pianist, um, which is pretty incredible. So, um, oh cool, Chopin is Lulu Key's favorite, always research the composers, that's awesome, Sue. It's so useful, I agree. I think it's one of the most useful things. Um, great, well, I'm gonna give you all some homework. Um, Today was just a one hour boot camp, so I'm not gonna be able to check in with you about this homework. So go ahead and respond to one of my emails or you know, DM me on Instagram or something and let me know how this homework is going for you. Or if you book a call, we can talk about it then. But make sure you get the PDF that accompanies today video, today's video. Everything we talked about will be in that PDF. You know, a lot of the practice suggestions and the things that I talked about. Um, if you don't have that PDF yet, you can, there's a link in the description to register for this event. So if you didn't do that, do that. And then you'll get the email with the PDF in it. Um, it'll go straight to your inbox. Um, if you want to go ahead and check out the last PDF or the, the last bootcamp where there were three, two free PDFs and we talked a ton about like time management, practice routines and all the techniques to make sure you have those supporting skills for musicality that is in the description below. I have tons of videos about practicing and all of this stuff that we talked about today. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel and start watching some of those videos for ideas on specific practice techniques and things like that. And then book a call with me. Um, oh, I didn't even explain what this slide is. This is my website, ashleyjyoung.com. And there's just a button that says book a free 15 minute call. And I have 
several spots open for next week. Um, and they'll, as they, they'll fill up. So, uh, go ahead and do that. If anybody has questions, feel free to email me. I do have one other question to answer and then we'll, we'll jump off to be respectful of your time. How do you keep the tempo consistent when you're not using the metronome, Diane? That is an awesome question. Oops. And, um, so the, my favorite way to practice keeping a consistent tempo without using the metronome is to, to bridge the gap between using the metronome and not using the metronome. So a digital metronome with the ability to turn down the volume is very helpful or an app on your phone or the Google metronome. If you just Google metronome, they'll come up with one where you can see a flashing light, but you can turn down the volume and not hear it. So when you want to practice, let's say you're working on a piece and your tempo is 100, you would of course play the piece at 100 a lot of times until that felt really comfortable. And then you would start practicing producing 100 from thin air. So you're in the middle of doing dishes or you're in the middle of something else that's not related to piano and you say, okay, what is 100? And you try to find that tempo and then you open your metronome app or you go grab your metronome and you check in with yourself and you say, how close was I to finding 100? I was a little slow and then you readjust and then you turn it off. And so you, you start to test yourself on your ability to produce the tempo of 100 or whatever it is that your tempo is out of thin air, because that's the first skill that we need to keep a consistent tempo is we have to know that tempo and be able to produce it, right? Then when you are practicing your piece, you start to, once you feel really comfortable practicing at 100, you start to turn the volume off of your metronome. So you have the metronome sitting next to your music, you turn the volume off, but you have that little flash of a light there. And you look down at your hands or look at your music and you play. And after a phrase or two, you look up at the metronome and you make sure that you're still at that same tempo. And then you play for a phrase or two and then you look up and you make sure that you're at the same tempo. And what you'll probably find if you haven't done this before is that you are not often at the same tempo. <laughs> um, in which case, there's nothing wrong with you. That's a part of the process um, that happens to all of us. In which case you work phrase by phrase and you just do that with a phrase. So you practice that phrase and then maybe like distract yourself for a second and then go back to that phrase and check in with yourself. And what you'll find is that after a few practice sessions of doing this, there, the amount of times that you are with the metronome will start to increase. Um, from that first time that you tried it, you will eventually get to the point where you know exactly in a piece, like I rush at measure 33. I need to remember when I get to measure 33, not to rush. I have a tendency to slow down here at measure 47 and I need to remember not to slow down at measure 47. And you'll start to get to know yourself in that piece. You'll start to get to know exactly where your strengths and weaknesses are. And then you can make adjustments for those. But that's my, that's my number one recommendation. And Diane, I have a couple of videos that talk about that a little more in depth than where I like explain it more in depth. So if you look on my channel in the rhythm playlist and I can link that in the video, um, that'd be a great place to start to find some more explanations in depth of, of that process. That's a really great question. Thanks for asking that, Diane. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for spending your Tuesday afternoon with me. I am so grateful to you. Um, I hope that you book a call and that I get to know you a little bit. Um, I'm going to keep that button up on the website probably for the next like couple of days if you're not watching this live, if you're watching this after the fact. Um, otherwise, I will see you around. I have a new video coming out on Thursday and a couple of new exciting things in the works, so just stay tuned. You are all amazing and awesome. Congratulations on um, taking steps to be a better pianist. Happy practicing. I'll see you later.